Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, is it the policy of your office for U.S. attorneys to use prosecutorial quotas? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a little difficulty here. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll get right on top of this thing. Is it the policy of your office for U.S. attorneys to use prosecutorial quotas? To prosecute? Yeah, do you have any prosecutorial quotas system in place? No, no. None, none whatsoever. That, that'd be anathema to, uh, to uh, your office then, right? I mean, it's not a policy. So would you no, we, be... We don't, uh, correct, yeah. we do not have quotas. Right. And so would it be consistent with that when you have a prosecutor said that they're gonna pro he wants to prosecute at least 2,000 people who are alleged to have committed a certain type of crime? So look, I think you're referring to the January 6th question. I'm just asking you, would that be consistent with your office's policy if somebody said, we're gonna get, we're gonna get up to 2,000 people on a particular crime? Is that consistent with your policy? I think what that U.S. attorney was referring to was a prediction for how many more cases would still be brought uh, that because the court had asked how many more people have he been He filed a letter with the court saying that we're, lo we're, gonna, we're looking at upwards of 2,000, we've got 1,200 more in the that we think we're going to get. So you don't, you don't do that for any, anything else, right? So you don't, you don't do have anything like tax fraud. You're not saying, okay, we're going to have so many people that we want to get for tax fraud, so many people no, we, we want to get don't, for we don't lying have on federal firearms If a court asks us what the likely workload will be based on prosecutions what? and investigations that are pending, the, the U.S. attorney is obligated to respond. Did you guys provide any, any reference of the number of people you thought uh, you would prosecute who were involved in the 2020 summer uh, riots of the burning of the Portland courthouse while there were still people inside those courthouses. You didn't, you didn't ever file with the court anything, say, oh, we think we're going to have another 300, 400, whatever it may be, because you didn't file those charges, did you? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not following. I believe that the... I'm uh, sure you're not. The number that you're asking about was... Let me the ask you this question. ...the objection that the court had asked the U.S. attorney to make. Let's switch, let's switch topics. Yeah. I, maybe this one would be uh, um, easier to follow, I suppose. Is it the policy of the DOJ to provide advance notice to subjects before, conduct, before conducting a search for evidence? It, it totally depends on the circumstance. If the circumstance were that you had uh, a guest house where the U.S. attorney, uh, deputy U.S. attorney saying, well, we know that there's, we, we suspect there's a lot of evidence there, but uh, we're not going to, we're not going to really follow that up. We're going to, and calls the attorney from the other side saying we were going to do a search warrant. Would, would that be consistent with your policy? Look, again, I know this is no hypothetical, um, and I don't know the facts of this case, and I don't know what happened, and I believe the events you're talking about, as reported in the press, occurred under the previous administration. So I'm, that, that, I'm No, no, no. No, that event didn't happen in the previous administration. Let's, let's talk about that. I mean, you keep saying this happened in the previous administration. Um, but let's, let's talk about this for just a, mo a moment. You keep saying, I don't know what happened there, but I'm going to opine when it happened. Do you see the, the fallacy of that, the inconsistencies? I don't know when it happened. I don't know what happened because I'm not involved, but it happened under the previous administration. That's so logically fallacious. I'm sorry, I'm not following what's Yeah, I know you're not following. So, yeah. so the question is, you... You've got one of your deputy U.S. attorneys calling the attorney on this side saying, look, we, there's, we're going to go to these two places, uh, probably go in the next couple of days. And, of course, then ultimately the search warrant is called off. Is that, I just want to know, is it consistent to call up people and, where you know that they've got boxes of information or you suspect they have boxes of information? That's why you got the warrant. That's why you're going to go look and you give them a heads up so they can move those boxes of information, would that be consistent with DOJ policy? I'm just going to say again, you're asking me actually to comment about allegations in a particular case about which I'm, no, I I'm not, not No, I'm not. I'm asking you, is that consistent with your overall policy? Forget, forget Delaware and what they did and that they actually did that. Let's just talk about generic I'm so, policy. I'm sorry, I thought you were asking about Mar-a-Lago. I, I, I may not have understood that. I'm oh, sorry. yeah, la di -da. So when we're talking about this, when we're talking about your general policy, is it your policy? Is that acceptable? When you suspect that there are movable items 
to call up and say we're gonna, we're gonna be there to look. Now, there's no policy on this question. The strategy and tactics to be used to preserve evidence are left up to the uh, investigators uh, and offices on the ground. Sometimes it would be a serious mistake uh, to call up. Uh, sometimes and, it would and not. Here, and here, once again, you don't know what happened in the Hunter Biden case because that's somebody else is doing it. But, but you can be sure of the timing of when all this took place. That is one of the biggest oddities of your testimony today. I yield back to the gentleman from Colorado. I'm the gentleman's time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from uh, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Attorney General. Thank you for your decades of faithful service to our country to our Constitution, and to the rule of law. Thank you for putting up with this today. Uh, the American people are watching. They know what's going on here. This is a gross misuse of your time, your team's time, and our time. It is a shameful circus. It has a goal. The goal is to spew lies and disinformation, ultimately to tear away at the confidence of our independent institutions, in your case today, our very important Department of Justice. That's the exact MO of a former president. Tear away at the confidence of our independent institutions, whether it's our electoral system, the Department of Justice, the judiciary, uh, and independent news media. The American people are watching this sham. But it's not just a circus, it's dangerous, and you know that, and you have mentioned that. I believe that these fictions and fantasies are dangerous. Dangerous for you and the 115,000 public servants with whom you work. Dangerous for national security. Dangerous for communities' security. Dangerous for the rule of law and our Constitution. All at the same time of a looming shutdown. The other side of the aisle cannot govern. And so they have this hearing, which was supposed to be oversight, and use it as a big distraction because they are failing to govern. Imagine if we go into a shutdown. What does that say to your members of your department? What does it say to our service members, U.S. troops who would be training, fighting without pay and without confidence in this country's governing ability? It's a great distraction. So let me pivot to something I care about and I know you and your department cares about. It is recovery month. And for families like mine with a member in recovery, every month is recovery month. So I thank you for what you are doing on the fentanyl crisis, the overdose crisis that has claimed 110,000 lives in a single 12-month period, 300 souls a day, every day. Souls who have died while we were in this hearing, every day. What is the department doing uh, to, to combat the trafficking, to combat the amount of fentanyl on the ground. As DEA has said, there's enough fentanyl on the ground right now to kill this entire population multiple times over. Tell us about your important work in fentanyl. Well, Congressman, let me, Congresswoman, let me begin um, by saying I share your uh, personal um, uh, con concern and grief over this. I have met with uh, the families of, uh, uh, of, of children, of teenagers, of elderly people who have become addicted to fentanyl and who have died from fentanyl. I know, everything you're saying is correct, um, and it's a catastrophe for the country. Uh, so as a consequence, um, the Justice Department has poured its resources, particularly from DEA, with FBI assistance as well, and with fugitive uh, arrests by the uh, Marshal Service and with gun tracing by the ATF, into the entire um, um, process by which fentanyl reaches the United States. So we have sanctioned the precursor companies in China. Um, we have indicted uh, some of them for uh, their violations. We have arrested uh, some as far, off in, uh, fee as far off as in Fiji and brought them back to the United States. Uh, we have traced this, um, uh, these precursors to Mexico where they are made into um, the fentanyl uh, pills. Um, um, fentanyl costs about 10 cents to make. It can be sold on the street in the United States between 10 and $30. You can see uh, what the enormous uh, profit motive um, is here. So we must stop the cartels themselves. 
I have, as I said, traveled to Mexico twice in order to work with our counterparts in the military and law enforcement there. I, th I thank you for all of that. I want to just pivot once, and, and I want to do anything I can to partner with you uh, on this issue so that we stop losing people. I traveled recently with the Foreign Affairs Committee to The Hague, met with the extraordinary folks, uh, the top prosecutor uh, and his able team. They were very complimentary of the Department of Justice and your work. Can you tell us about your important role or America's important role in war crimes, especially in light of your powerful history? Yes, history. Um, I'm, I'm happy to. So um, I have traveled to Ukraine twice. Uh, and uh, to meet with the prosecutor general there, um, and I'm going to meet with him again this week here, um, and he has met with me several times here. Um, the Justice Department is pursuing uh, the war crimes from Russia's uh, uh, unlawful and unjust invasion of Ukraine uh, to help uh, to investigate war crimes over which we have jurisdiction, to help the prosecutor general in Ukraine investigate those, inv um, those prosecutions. I um, was, I believe, the first cabinet member ever to uh, visit The Hague, uh, the International Criminal Court of Justice, and to meet with Karim Khan, who is the uh, chief prosecutor, uh, to talk about our cooperation um, uh, in respect to the investigations uh, that they are doing. I've assigned a, uh, um, um, a Justice Department uh, prosecutor um, to the um, um, investigatory body that's been set up in The Hague for the crime of aggression. Um, and she is there now working with um, the ICC uh, and um, with Euro, Europol and Eurojust. And I've assigned uh, prosecutor uh, to the, our embassy in Kyiv um, to work with our um, uh, ambassador there and to work with the prosecutor general's office there. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing that answer to go on because it is critically important. Uh, America is indispensable time, and your work is indispensable. Time, thank time, you, sir. Time of the general lazy